metal wings to fly won't take you to the stars. Use the metal for a boat and you won't sail too far. Stop sitting in the dark, stirring metal pots about. You will change your life forever when you figure out. The secret code, 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 Signs can be tricky, it can overheat your brain. Signs can be hard to chew, each bite can be a pain. Stop sitting in the dark, stirring metal pots about. You will change your life forever when you figure out. The secret code, Ladies and gentle creatures, it's that time of year again. Cast your eyes on this fierce competition for Miss Macrocosm. Tonight, you will determine the winner by means of popular vote. Hey, don't forget that you promised her your vote. Don't forget our deal. <gasps> there can only be one. But who? <laughs> it's unanimous! The votes are in! According to our audience, this year's Miss Macrocosm is, unsurprisingly, Rosa! Congratulations, friend! And now, let's see what you've won! Come on, Chef, let's eat! Best cake in the universe. <clears throat> Miss Macrocosm, made for you. Fantastic! Mm. <laughs> All good. <laughs> oh, Rosa. Just like the macrocosm itself. Like all space, you just remain the same. Well, actually, Wally, space is always changing. The universe is expanding and will keep doing it forever. Um, kind of like uh, a balloon. No. Oh. Hmm. Can the universe grow until it explodes? Oh, of course not. Let me explain it to you. At one time, the universe as we know it didn't even exist yet. So where was it? Sleeping? Not exactly. Before the universe, there was no mass, no energy, and even no time. Ooh, look! I'ma touch the thing! Stop! Better give that thing some space. At least a few billion billion miles worth of space. That tiny speck houses everything that will ever exist. And it's about to get a big wake-up call right about... Now! Welcome to the Big Bang! This is the moment at which time and space start to exist. And matter, and mass, and energy, and everything in between. These particles sped out from that explosion and eventually started to form stars and planets. It took 13.8 billion years for the universe to expand and create our world as we know it today. It's still speeding away? It's not just speeding away, Crash. It's getting faster and faster. It's the opposite of what you'd imagine, right? Scientists aren't exactly sure why this is. There's matter called dark energy that fills up most of the universe we can see. Our macrocosmos is expanding and we don't know why. We've got no idea. I am expanding, just like the cosmos. Just no point in denying it. Tomorrow, I'll change. It's time for a workout. Whoa, what's this? Oh! What's going on? Anyone there? What is this? Who are you? I am the universe. I'm everything. The expanding cosmos. And you are? Oh, I'm Miss Macrocosmos, beauty queen. Though recently I've gained a, gained a few inches here and there. Gained a few inches, huh? 
Oh, friend, I grow millions and millions of miles every second. That sounds a bit dangerous. I'd be afraid that one day I just might, you know, explode. Explode? Explain. Like this. Watch. How do I stop it? It's self-discipline. Just uh, avoid carbs. Aw, oh, come on now. But bread is so good. But so is not exploding. Let's be diet buddies together. I'm baffled, but our universe has stopped expanding. And actually, it's... it's shrinking. I can't believe it. Hooray! Atta girl! She's doing it! There's nothing good about this! I don't feel like things are shrinking. We can't be shrinking! This is a big deal here. Scientists have confirmed that the universe is shrinking. <laughs> How'd they do it? A big tape measure? I don't think that's what universal size means. Super long! <laughs> Not quite. Astronomers use a tool that is much more precise than that, which is light. Light? Of course it's light. In space, distance is measured by light years. One light year is the distance light can travel across the vacuum of space in one year's time. And there are thousands and thousands of light years between each star. I still don't get it. We use light to measure space? And we can see that it's shrinking? Easy! We know light is made of many different colors and waves. The color we see depends on that light ray's wavelength. Here's how scientists know which wavelength is which. Red has the longest wavelength, while violet has the shortest. Stars usually glow yellowish-white. They're constantly moving, which is how we can see them. The color of a star can tell us which way it's moving in relation to us. For example, if a star is coming near us, the light appears blue because of the shorter wavelength. And if it's speeding away from us, that light appears more reddish. The wavelengths are longer. So, if the universe expanded away from us, the stars would be redder? You're precisely correct. Even now, the stars are changing. Now they're blue, so the universe is shrinking. It's coming in quickly. Who cares? She's a beautiful universe. It's her choice. Well, we should care if we want to survive. This has some serious implications. Shortly, it seems the cosmos will reverse back to the Big Bang. Just a small dot. Um, so we'll get squished? We won't feel it. We'll burn up long before that happens. As stars get closer, the temperature will continue to rise, and all life will become extinguished in fire. 
<laughs> we'll explode, huh? No. First, we'll catch fire. Man, this is gonna be crazy! What a ride! Whee! <gasps> hey! Miss Universe! Hey, workout pal! So, notice anything different? Like a few billion light years? Soon I'll be my goal size, my pre Big Bang weight, <laughs> just a point. Listen, you're setting impossible standards. You're jealous? No, actually not. Why, you're looking blue, and it's getting too hot. But it is my choice. Plus, I don't even crave sugar anymore. But you're beautiful just as you are. The wonderful, endless universe. You're all that is. You can't let your size define you. Plus, there's no point in lying to ourselves. Bread is just perfection. Um, I don't know. You're saying I should expand, huh? Just be yourself, girl. Everyone benefits from just being themselves. I should know. I miss macrocosm. I'm... The universe. I should decide for myself what beauty means. I reject ridiculous beauty standards. I am the all powerful. And you're right, Red Rocks. Yeah! Well, I guess this is it. We'll all be swallowed by the cosmos. Hmm. Question, do you spell it last testament or test o -ment? Oh, Will, no one will be here for your stuff. I have good news! The universe is going to be just fine! Ha! You guys, we all get to live another day! <laughs> hey! Who said you get all the cake, Missy? You're welcome for saving the universe. She's beautiful. <laughs> So am I. Eat up, Rosa. I think we can all agree you're perfect <laughs> how you are. Agreed, agreed. Miss Macrocosm. <laughs> the universe's expansion was discovered by three scientists, Saul Perlmutter, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Reese. They figured out that the universe was expanding, though we still can't pinpoint the reason. They were each awarded the Nobel Prize for their astounding discovery. that parents tell their children they have fantasy plots and try to teach a lesson. You want to hear a fairy tale? Uh, sorry, I don't really know how to tell any. Fine, come back here. I shouldn't have programmed you to be so cute. Okay, the story starts somewhere. Once upon a time, there was a wonderful, uh, arctic with a handsome, uh, penguin scientist. Wrong! You're already doing it wrong! Start with a princess. But how did I start wrong? Don't you know fairy tales? They need a princess and they all have a love story. And you should change the place. It's, uh, cold up there. <laughs> Is that so? Well, fine, I guess. It begins in the, uh, warm climate of Somewheresville. And there's a beautiful princess, because apparently that's how they start. And one day she ran into a, um, uh, musician. Yeah, he played the lute. It was love at first sight. Ahem, I said it was love at first sight. Hmm? <laughs> he decided to write the most beautiful song to impress Her Royal Highness. So he did. He played the best song, and she was very impressed. 
and then they got married, and they all lived happily ever after. They also got tax exemptions, which he needed as a musician. That's it? All he did was play a song? And he got the princess? <laughs> uh, maybe it was a magic song. The problem with your story is that there's no conflict. Nothing. Don't you see? Listen up. He can't get the princess just like that. He has to earn it. Make him work for it. <sighs> All right, fine. Now there is a bad guy who is no fun. <sighs> <gasps> Huh? You're a hoot if you think that you can have her hand. Uh, that sounds right. <gasps> now you're stuck. You have to earn it. <laughs> I'm progressing the story with some conflict. <laughs> hey, princess. <clears throat> <laughs> so what happened next? I don't know. The tower's too tall, and maybe he left. They need a way to talk. There has to be some way to communicate. But how, though? Our heroes should use the classic telephone. Telephones take the sound waves we make with our voice and change them into electrical impulses. These originally traveled by copper wire. The electrical signals would travel to the recipient and be converted back into sound waves. As long as those copper wires reach us, we can talk to someone halfway across the globe or a fairy tale kingdom. It'd be no problem to get telephone wires up the tower. Uh, hold on a second. So my fairy tale world has technology now? <laughs> Just a thought. Seems your characters are in a quandary. It's your story after all. You can tell it as you like. Okay, fine. They have a telephone. The poor musician was at a loss. Then he had an idea. He had a friend who could help him out. The clever know-it-all wizard. The wizard said to him, You're in luck, my friend, because in this fairy tale world I have endless funding. Yesterday I invented something phenomenal. It's called a telephone. When the wizard was done patting himself on the back, our hero took the new machine out of the tower, determined to make the storyline work. I mean, woo the princess. Hmm? The princess could finally hear the song and was impressed by the technology. They were happy forever and all was well. Hang on. That can't be everything. Oh, you're right. I forgot about the story's bad guy. Sounds to me the telephone's an easy way out. The witch wouldn't take kindly to this. <laughs> and she'd fight them. She'd cast a storm of magic. That'd do it. Not an actual storm. That would mess things up bad. Whatever. You think the princess is afraid of some lightning? I think she's a little better than that. Yeah, the musician is brave. In the story. Ah, uh, no doubt our heroes are brave. But it's the telephones we should be worried about. Remember, the electrical signals travel by copper wire. They have a magnetic field around them that help the pulses move. The problem with a physical copper wire is that someone can easily tap into that connection. Hey, you! Stop listening! Other problems can arise, too. The wires can be sensitive to radio waves. And lightning, too. Since it's electricity, just like the pulses in the wires. 
With old phones, sometimes even electric engines can interfere. With these old school phone wires, a lot of things can make them go haywire. Get it? <laughs> Never mind. Because of that, a thunderstorm would really mess things up for our story's heroes. Good! That's what she should do. A minor hurricane should do it. <laughs> You think you're clever, huh? Ah, lightning! <gasps> then what? The princess can never hear his music, and they never find each other? Beats me! Mm hmm. That's brilliant! They can use the power of fiber optics instead of wires. Good job! What's fiber optics? Like oatmeal? Good solution! If you have a light source, you can spread the light by moving it to a body of water. The water will reflect within the water's edges, meaning the light will travel wherever the water travels. <gasps> That must be how the lighted fountains work at fancy hotels! They're so pretty! How surprisingly perceptive of you, Rosa! That's exactly right! By this same principle, light can move with the help of wires. These wires are glass instead of copper. They're also called optical waveguides. Here's how they work. Light enters the outer shell of the glass wire and bounces along the waveguide. The light particles travel wherever the wire goes. Aren't fiber optics interesting? And luckily for our fairy tale heroes, fiber optics can also be used to transmit sound waves. In the very same way, sound travels through through the wires and can be converted to different types of media. You can even convert the sound waves into light waves. Isn't technology phenomenal? The sound waves can go through all kinds of different formats. Eventually, they get converted back into sound waves that our princess can hear. And here's something even better about fiber optics. It's a lot safer. There's less of a chance someone can listen in to your conversation. As another bonus, they aren't affected by external sounds, lightning, or engines. It's just what they need. Assuming they don't have copper, this could work better. To make fiber optics, all they need is quartz. And that is found in sand. <laughs> the characters have lots of that. They're in a desert. You're so right. The smart aleck wizard invented a new phone that used fiber optic cables instead of normal ones. He tossed the receiver up to the tower and played his beautiful song. This time, the sound was undeterred by lightning. The princess was impressed with the music. Not exactly Mozart, but her options were limited. And the annoying villain was finally out of options. <gasps> Does that end the story? Were they happy? I'd say so. This time the hero earned it. Don't forget, they also earned phenomenal phone service. <laughs> <laughs> No, Bibi. They just made up. That's why they're called fairy tales. Just remember that none of that actually happened. Oh, well, maybe that story happened in a different universe. Using glass wires instead of copper ones is a huge breakthrough in phone communication. Fiber optics have made technology soar in the past few years. Fiber optics also contributed to the internet, making the whole world connected. And we have this guy to thank for it, Charles Cao, an electrical engineer from Hong Kong who won the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering fiber optics. Ha-ha! 
Yo yo yo. Ho ho. Chupu chupu chupu. Yo 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 yo. My poor eyes. I need some shades before I can look upon such sparkling radiance. Don't you flatter. We have a game to play. I won't go easy on you for the compliments. <laughs> now then, where were we? We were, I believe, at the part where you lose. That's not fair. You started without me. I had no chance then. Then maybe someone should have been on time. But I had a good reason. It was really, uh, super important. Oh yeah, sure it was. My mistake. I didn't realize that having shiny antlers is of utmost importance. You just don't understand it. Antler care is important. It's part of moose culture. The age-old tradition of young moose getting their first tines. We have to keep up with them. They're ours. Our antlers are our culture, our symbol. It's basically a hat. Symbol. Mm. Carlin, they are far more than a hat. Perhaps you would like a demonstration. Watch yourself. Don't get hit by a ball. Huh. That's not all. Alley-oop. You want more, huh? Here, try this. <laughs> I'm looking sharp. <laughs> oh, watch this! It's an antler stand! It's fine, I've seen enough. Don't do it! <laughs> 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 Well, mm-hmm. Pulse is fine. His heart sounds normal. He's good. I think he just needs to sleep it off. But what of his antlers? Is there a chance they might never, um, grow back? You mean those weird things he doesn't really need? Shh! Daco isn't exactly a spring chicken. That might have been his last pair. Once a moose starts to reach an older age, uh, they might never grow them back. Is there something you can do? He loved them. It just seems really sad. I can't change biology. Let me use a cutscene. All animals, including us, of course, are made of these little things called cells. They make up every part of us. Cells have the ability to divide. That's how they reproduce. And cells dividing makes us grow. We start off as tiny cells and become adults. Cells can't live forever. Some get damaged or get old and die. Luckily, they get replaced with brand new ones. This would come in handy if, say, you tried out a new chic bald style and regretted it. Those cells would get to work bringing you back to your feathered self. Uh, maybe we can grow back Daco's antlers. Hold your horse feathers. They can't just do whatever you want them to do. Yes, if a cell gets damaged, it gets replaced by a new one. But it can't do that forever. Eventually, there's a limit, like lives in a video game. And if you destroy cells faster than they reproduce, it's game over. Please, you look a wreck. Why not get some air? Go outside. 
I'd only be stealing the air away from the young people. Plus, now that my antlers are gone, I have more, um, free time. So now, I can do more nothing. Please, friend. They're only antlers. And none of us have them. Just leave me, Carlin, so I can be forgotten. I'm going to drown my sorrows. What happened to the energetic young moose that I knew? You used to love tackling a problem. You dive headfirst into it and grab life by the horns. Uh, sorry, excuse the euphemism. Oh, well, there are no horns to grab. You're not trying. The friend I knew would make science <clears throat> work for him. Surely you can make new antlers. Oh, if only things were that simple. No way could I just make them. Cells are way more complex. <clears throat> Then you think they are. Then teach me. Almost all organisms start out as a single cell. They divide from there and create all sorts of different traits. So our fur, feathers, and wool all come from the same type of cell as the rest of us? <laughs> Does that mean we can grow any new part from another part of our body? Not even close. Each cell in us has its own job, unless we're talking about stem cells. The first cells to appear in our bodies are called stem cells, and they're pretty unique. What makes them interesting is that they can turn into any type of cell. They could become bones, or fur, or, you know, a beautiful pair of antlers, even. Altogether, they eventually become the organism known as us. Once stem cells decide their job, they can't change their mind. This one hasn't chosen a job yet. Every organism keeps some around just in case. It's like they're an emergency repair team. The unemployed stem cells hang around lying in wait, but when something gets damaged, those guys jump into action. Some stem cells rush over to the damaged area and become whatever type of cell is needed. That's absolutely genius. We'll just find some stem cells lying around your body and tell them to build your antlers and they'll be better than ever before. Maybe you can give requests like blue antlers. No, it's not as easy as that. They're not that common. Even babies only have one in 10,000 cells. As we get older, those odds get worse and worse. My odds of having some are not phenomenal. Your face is phenomenal. <laughs> Once pin shrinks us down to the cellular level, our job is to find the bone and, uh, <sighs> moving on. We must find bone marrow so we can find our objective. And our goal is stem cells. Our chances are slim. Less than one in a million, but let's do it for Daco. Wow, what did Daco eat? Clearly he ate sales, Olga. We're looking for one tiny stem cell. What a way to spend an afternoon. And I was just gonna watch Dancing with the Bears. <laughs> oh! <laughs> hey! <laughs> oh, look at me! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha 
So I said, just take me back to hibernation. Everyone, a word? I can't thank you all enough. I'm amazed at the Herculean effort you made for me. You could say it's enormous. I have nothing but gigantic appreciation for the huge amount of work you've done. You could say that I'm falling over with admiration for my friends. The idea of stem cells was first suggested by Russian scientist Alexander Alexandrovich Maximov. Wow, what a name. But stem cells were only recognized in 2007 when the Nobel Prize was awarded for their discovery. Our stem cell heroes are Mario Capecci from Italy, Sir Martin J. Evans from England, and Oliver Smithies from the United States. Thanks for your discoveries, guys. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. I told everyone to come in for a mandatory vaccination. Everyone. And did everyone come in and get their vaccination? Adrenaline! Mandatory. Understand? Doesn't anybody know what mandatory means? Pickled pellets, people, please. It's one itsy bitsy injection. Seriously? Are you a bunch of babies? Adrenaline! <laughs> I hope you don't think that's clean enough, but there's always one who thinks they're special. The rules don't apply to them. They think they're above it all. <laughs> um, you're doing it wrong. Some genius. All he had to do was get one tiny shot. But not him, because he knows better. <laughs> Penguins never get sick. That's what he said right to my face. And now his body's like a theme park for viruses. <sighs> Sneezing, coughing, high temperature. He's ruined his own health and put the rest of ours at risk. Viruses don't give a hoot if you're a penguin or something else. Did I stutter? I said everyone needs vaccination. How do you everyone. think she feels about vaccination? What? Now, back to vaccination. I said to everyone, mandatory mm. vaccinations with no exceptions. It's not my fault. Mm, yeah, that's worse than it was. Now, Mr. Penguins never get sick. How's that working out? Everyone, huh? Come take a look. <laughs> sick, unwell, infected, contagious. What more, I ask you, could this humble owl have possibly done? I use the words mandatory Whoa. vaccination. Olga, you've got a phone call. Me? Who? The, um, Minister of Health. All right. I'm telling him on you. Penguin irresponsibility. Complete disregard for that. That much coffee like turns Olga up. bananas. Yes, it does. Uh. Looks fun. Can I play? This isn't a game. It's a graphic representation of all of Pin's vital signs. Temperature, blood pressure, pulse. From here, we can monitor the battle. Groovy! Who's fighting who? The leukocytes inside Pin's body are fighting the viruses. A battle? Inside Pin? <laughs> yes, but unfortunately, the leukocytes don't seem to be winning at the moment. Chico, this is serious. Oh. Hmm? Hmm. You heard what Daco just said? Yes, but I didn't understand it. Look, there's only one thing to understand. There are good guys fighting against bad guys inside Pin's body. And the bad guys are winning right now. Vaccination. Hmm? Mandatory vaccination. Come on. Whether you're a penguin or a minister or a radioactive space monkey, there are no exceptions. Viruses don't care how many followers you have on Facebook or how sleek and shiny your feathers are. We have to find a way to help the good guys inside Pin's body. But no. I have an idea. Adrenaline. Drop the mop. Oh. 
Voila! There's our combat vessel! But that's the smallerizing module. Exactly! Once we're both nice and smallerized, we'll fly inside Pin's body and help the good guys destroy the bad guy viruses! Wow, that's a terrible idea. Listen up, computer. Smallerize us by, hmm, a thousand. Okie doke. Terrible idea. Let's get small. Terrible idea. Congratulations, you are tiny. The Smallerizer battery will keep you this size for 30 minutes. Check it out! We're totally teeny tiny! Oh, whoa! Here we go! <laughs> We're as small as a pill! Eensy teensy! <laughs> Pretty awesome, right? Plot a course, computer! From here to infirmary! Yes, Master. Keep flying straight, then take the next right. Now, Turn right again. Hey, let's take a shortcut here. Why? Okay, fine. Recalculating. Um, um, bear left at the fork in the tunnel up ahead. No, your other left. <sighs> Recalculating. Ow! I don't feel so good. Oh, recalculating. Er, la calculatory. Where are we going again? I'll be honest. I'm not exactly sure where we are right now. Is it hot in here, or is it just me? Maybe we should stop and ask directions. Where do you get your pilot's license? A cereal box? Wait, there's something up ahead. Why would the minister call me and then hang up before I got to the phone? <laughs> if anyone understands the I importance can't believe of it, but you have arrived at your destination. Well you cotton candy looking My maniacs. Oh, great! Seems in the water. Medicine time. Now we'll fly inside Pin. May the force be with us. Here goes! All he had to do was get one little shot. One, but no. Had to go adjust space bolts in a drafty old thruster suit. Well, here we are, in a glass full of medicine. Pretty clever, isn't it? Any second now, Pin will drink us down and we'll be inside him. I'm a genius. What if we're not small enough? If we're not, Pin could really choke on us. Hmm. Well, that would be bad. Listen up, computer. Smallerize us up. Mm, hundred times. What could possibly go wrong? Fine. Great Granny's Tussin recipe. This'll perk you right up. Oh, wow. Adrenaline. You're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Horribly wrong. Yep. Medicine. Drink it all. <laughs> That's a good penguin. Chico, we made it. We're inside Pin. We're the enemies. I don't see any bad guys or good guys. We're the guys. Hmm. Hey, you guys! Yo, Daco! Huh? Hiya! So, about that battle going on inside Pin, tell me more about that. Um, well, my inquisitive little friends, I'm always happy to give a lecture. Here it comes! Our bodies are constantly exposed to bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Some of these could be dangerous to us, but fortunately, we have natural defenses against these invaders. Our first line of defense is the largest organ in the human body, our skin. It creates a barrier that prevents most infectious agents from entering our bodies. Our eyes, which don't have skin, use tears that contain a bacteria-killing substance. And if the microbes end up inside our stomachs, many will not survive the harsh hydrochloric acid there, which helps us to digest our food. Um, huh? we're not headed for Penn's stomach, are we? I don't know. What was that? It was nothing. Go on. Right. Sure. However, 
Microbes do sometimes breach our outer defenses and make their way into our bodies. Once inside, they face white blood cells, also called leukocytes. These and other forces make up our body's immune system, our defense against disease. Uh, where did you say these viruses and microbes like to hang out? The circulatory system. Um, why are you talking to us from inside the smallerizer? Adrenaline! Yeah, I think that's enough coffee for Olga. Crash out! Mm, teenagers. Chico, did you get all that? Well, I got it. All the bad guys can be found in the blood pumping system. Which is there. Or there. Listen up, computer. Plot a course to Pin's bloodstream. Faster traffic or fewer tolls. Faster traffic sounds right. Calculating route. This does not look good at all. I've been trying to tell you that all day. <laughs> <laughs> all right, our big heroic mission is to help the good guy cells, um, to stand up against the bad invader viruses, which all seem to be hiding somewhere. Mm. Hmm. Wanna play hide and seek, do ya? Listen up, computer. Prepare our pressure suits. Well, there's a bunch of these red donuts but not any guys. I was afraid of that. Now who is who here? <laughs> Strange. <laughs> I can usually spot a bad guy just like that. Catastrophe! Chico and Crash are in the Smallerizer, and the Smallerizer is inside Pin! It's just like I said. Get your vaccination, or your body will get invaded. <laughs> By all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Coffee, anyone? I think I'm coming down with something. <sighs> It's all wrong. Hey, Michelangelo! Are you ever actually gonna draw anything? Painting. Not drawing, painting. You draw a caricature or a comic strip, stuff like that. But painting comes from your soul. It's art. <laughs> well, that's not a problem. You always said you're very artistic. And as for the soul, well, everyone's got one of them, right? So just pull something up out of it. You don't get it. You can't just pluck art out of yourself, like a berry. I have to interpret Saturn in a whole new way. But it's just a planet, a gas giant, rounded by a whole bunch of cosmic garbage that is formed into rings. How can there be any other way to interpret it but that one? Well, I can't say yet. That's why I haven't been able to start my painting. But I'm very certain that inspiration will come within a few weeks. <laughs> Are you serious, Carlin? It's just a ball in space with rings around it. How could that take weeks to draw? To paint. I could sculpt it out of cheese blindfolded by then. I'm not much of an artist, but anybody can paint a planet. <laughs> All right, Mr. Smarty Horns, prove it. Glad to. And my Saturn art, I would bet, will turn out better than yours does. I'll take your bet. 
The winner will be whichever of us creates the best artistic image of Saturn by midnight. Agreed. And whichever of us loses will have to stand in front of the entire crew and crow like a rooster. It's a bet. So, this gives me very little time to get this done. But I still feel no inspiration. But I'm a pro. Can't sit on my tail feathers and wait for my muse to come. I must find a way to grab her by the wings. I need to create the perfect atmosphere for inspiration. Now that's what I call a professional artist's approach. Another couple of incense candles, and my muse will come swimming right up. I wonder how things are going for poor Daco. He's probably crying in some corner, ready to just give up. I'll let Carlin be the artist, flitting everywhere, talking about muses and inspiration. <laughs> I've got science on my side. An artist sees light reflected from an object. The image leaves an imprint in his brain. After that, he transmits this image to paper. Normally, it takes talent to do this, but if you understand the science and the principles behind the laws of optics, then you don't need talent. This deceptively simple device was discovered centuries ago. All that's needed is a closed box. A tiny hole is made on one wall of the box to let in a thin beam of light. Once the box is lined up with the chosen scene, Light reflects off the scene and passes through the tiny hole, and an image of the scene appears on the opposite wall of the box. The image appears upside down and backwards because of the way light behaves. Because the box only works if it's dark inside, it was called a dark camera or camera obscura. All right, then. Let's make a big camera obscura out of my entire cabin. <whistles> Moose Eureka time! Now all I have to do is outline this projection, and Carlin will be crowing like a rooster in front of everyone in no time at all! <laughs> there. Beautiful. I'm so smart. Mm-hmm. What's so hard about this? I'm using an early Picasso abstract style for extra artiness. There. Oh, oh yeah, it's upside down, right. There, that's way better, yeah? Well, look closer. Don't forget that it's done in the abstract style of Picasso. Yeah, it's awful. I guess it's possible. I'm not as good at this art stuff as I thought. I need to come up with another method. Oh, that's great. A little lower. Intense, perfect inspiration is coming soon. I can feel it. Ah, oh, yeah. Muse time. <laughs> what? Huh? Did I win? Oh my. Well, relaxation has not led to inspiration, has it? Time to take the bull by the horns. Let's see. Hmm. I think this calls for space meditation. Um... I have found a new method. Now my lack of talent for painting won't matter. This way, I won't have to draw anything at all. I probably should have thought about this in the first place. Absolutely not, my judgmental friend. It isn't cheating at all. Why, this is pretty much just a better version of a camera obscura. Let me explain. Reflected light from a scene goes through a larger opening and is focused by a lens. 
Because more light is allowed into the box, a brighter image is produced. If light-sensitive film is placed in line with the reflection, the reflected image is then captured on the film. Color film uses color-sensitive image layers to capture the color of the reflected image. All you have to do is press the button. That's it! Oh, I guess I don't quite have the hang of this yet. This is bad, and I don't have time to get good at it. Guess I better think of something else. There are times when inspiration strikes because you're looking at your subject from an unexpected angle. Yeah, yeah. I know there isn't very much time left, but when genuine inspiration strikes, a talented artist can create a perfect masterpiece in only a few moments. Exactly what I'm planning to do, but without all the pretentious, silly, artsy, artsy stuff. No! Hmm? Scientifically, an image isn't anything but light reflected from an object, which in turn is perceived by our eyes. And finally, I've found the best way to document it. A digital camera. Yay! Metal is sensitive to the photoelectric effect. That light at a high enough frequency can cause a metal surface to emit electrons. When used in solar batteries, light falls on a semiconductor, like silicon wafers, and knocks electrons loose from the atoms. The electrons are then captured in a circuit to produce electrical power. Instead of film, digital cameras use a charge-coupled device, or CCD. This is a matrix of millions of attached microscopic charge bubbles called pixels. Light, focused by a lens, falls on the pixels of the CCD matrix and causes them to emit electrons. From this, the pixel receives an electrical charge that is stored in the pixel's capacitor. Then, the charges are moved along the matrix rows and dumped at the end of each row to be measured. These measurements are ultimately converted into an image. And that is how we can capture an image using neither talent nor long chemical processes. Just press the button and you're good to go. Hmm? Oh, oh, the battery's dead. Darn it, squared. Well, that's midnight. Guess I lost. That is the weak point of your method, dear old friend. Technological methods depend on other technological methods. <laughs> That is why I prefer classical media. You, all right. All right, let's have a look at your masterpiece. Uh, how about we just call it a draw? Whoa, it looks like both of us were beaten. Just one thing to do. The inventors of the CCD matrix are American physicists Willard S. Boyle and George E. Smith. The results of their invention are now used in every digital camera and have truly changed the world. In 2009, Boyle and Smith received the Nobel Prize in Physics for their incredible invention.